Question: What is the karma involved in wearing clothing stuffed with the down feathers from geese? Answer: If you have married and virtual, if you wear such clothing, you can cross the birds over. If you cultivate and make transference to them, you can increase their reward of blessings and lessen their offense karma. That's what happens when someone who cultivates wears such clothing. If it's someone who continually commits offenses, however, as he keeps on wearing such clothing, he will become the same as the geese, from having formed to close an association with them. He'd end up in cooperating with them, forming a corporation limited. So, although it's just a small matter, there are a great many principles involved, and it can't be completely discussed according to a single rationale. Sutra, he transcends all thought and form, destroys all relative thoughts, and does not have various thoughts. He enters boundless emptiness, and dwells in the station of boundless empty space. He transcends the station of the station of all boundless empty space, enters boundless consciousness, and dwells in the station of boundless consciousness. He transcends the station of all boundless consciousness. Commentary: He transcends all thought and form. The fourth dhyana is the ground of purity of renouncing thought. It is said. When a single thought is not produced, the entire substance manifests. When the six organs suddenly move, there is a covering of clouds. At this time, he transcends all thought and all form and destroys all relative thoughts. For him, there are no relative dramas, only the absolute, and so he does no thinking and thoughts do not exist, and he does not have various thoughts. He doesn't think all kind. Of thoughts, when thinking stops and thoughts are gone, that is true blessing and honor. When selfish design is brought to an end, that is the true field of blessings. He enters the boundless emptiness. At that time, he unites with the world. Space is just him and his empty space. He doesn't have a self or an emptiness. Both self and empty space are gone, and he dwells in the station of boundless empty space. He dwells in the station of boundless emptiness, yet is free from the station of boundless emptiness. That is to dwell within dwelling and to be stationed without a station. Although he is said to dwell in the station of boundless empty space, he basically has transcended emptiness. What is it like to be beyond emptiness? You haven't reached that state, and so you don't know. And I haven't reached it either, and so I don't know. It just、uh, that it says in the sutra, he transcends in the station of all boundless empty space. At that time, inside that there is no mind or body. Outside there is no world. One sweeps away all dhammas and is free from all marks. He enters boundless consciousness. At this point, he is going through the four boundless stations: the st- station of boundless empty space, the station of boundless consciousness, the station of nothing whatsoever, the station of neither thought nor non-thought. He here enters boundless consciousness. Consciousness is boundless in this time. For him, there is not emptiness, but he still has not emptied consciousness. He enters boundless consciousness. And then he dwells in the station of boundless consciousness. He dwells in it, and then he transcends that station of all boundless consciousness. He also transcends that station of boundless consciousness, and so arrives at the station of nothing whatsoever. After that, will be the the station of neither thought nor non-thought. In short, all of those thoughts are emptied. He has passed through the four dhyanas, and now is the is in the state of the four stations of emptiness. Right now, there are people thinking. I keep hearing about the four dhyanas, but I don't understand what they are, and、uh, I'm even less clear about the four stations of emptiness. Couldn't you discuss them in detail? The four dhyanas are states experienced through meditation. 
they are the heavens of the first dhyana, which is also called the ground of the first dhyana. When the, the aspect of heavens is stressed, the meaning is that of naturalness. When approached from the aspect of growth, the meaning is that of production and growth. The person sitting in dhyana sees in such a way that inside there is not body or mind. The mind is emptied, and so is the body, and the self-nature manifests, emitting a kind of light that is called the ground of joy of separation from production. Separation here means to leave behind all defined thoughts, all false thoughts and afflictions. What is produced is the result for body and wisdom, along with understanding of the mind prana. That is the ground of joy of separation from production. It's not a state you can claim to have attained when you haven't. There is something that proves you are in the first dhyana with its heavens. When it happens, as you are sitting in meditation, your path stops. Yet, this is not something you say is happening to you. You yourself are unaware of it. You need certification from a good knowing advisor that you have reached the state. Why don't you yourself know? When you, your path stops, you have entered Samadhi and you don't have any idea your path has stopped. So, if you yourself say, my path has stopped, that to tell a lie as a big as all creation. Why? Well, you could, you could know. How could you know? If you know your path has stopped, then your path hasn't stopped. The reason is that you're in Samadhi when it happens and so are unable to know. You may say, I find out when I come out of Samadhi. But as soon as you come out of Samadhi, your path starts up again. So how could you yourself know about it? Then you ask, how does the good knowing advisor know about it? There are because of your having experienced any state you've been th through as if notes were taken. When you have had such a state, all the good knowing advisor has to do is take one look at you and he see your coloring has changed and so has your light and the energy when you breathe is different you're the same person and are breathing in the un, uh, in the usual way yet that prana true is not the way it was before you can't pretend i've been to the first day now my pants came to a stop that's utterly shameless you've had to go through a good knowing advisor a bright eyed one someone without eyes can't be a good knowing advisor a good advisor who has opened a wisdom eye has to certify you saying now you've reached the first jhana it's not something you say yourself like saying i've already become a buddha did you know i've already become enlightened how can you certify your own enlightenment a good knowing advisor has to has to certify that you actually have become enlightened and say now you do you haven't taken the wrong road that was right you can't certify yourself it's as when a person breaks the law and the police say you have broken the law and you are under arrest there has to be some proof some evidence that you did break the law you are innocent until proven guilty in the same way, someone has to testify that you are enlightened and that witness is the good knowing advisor. It's been along that road before you. You can't say, I've opened enlightenment on my own, unless it's at a time when no Buddha is in the world and in distant mountains and remote valleys, you cultivate the travelings of conditioned co-production and become enlightened. But then you are one solitarily enlightened, you've become an ahat. All we are talking about here are the first and second dhyanas. When you certify to the fruit of ahatship, then you know the past, the present, and the future, and know what level you yourself have reached. It's not that you sit in meditation for 20 minutes or so and get enlightened. It if it were that easy, then everyone would be enlightened. Your path stops, but it's not that you say, 